I got it. Since we are all here to learn specifically about working with content, images, presentation, I'm going to skip the part where we often sometimes introduce one another. I will simply say to each of you that I am aware that some of you may be coming to this training very practiced in assembling material that you're showing on a screen, a slide, or assembling something that you're going to show visually. Some of you may be very new at this. Some of you may be unfamiliar with it at all, like where do I go to start? This session is intended to cover a lot of basics, probably in a short amount of time. The fact that Rhonda is recording it is wonderful, but not only that, I'm willing to share any resources, materials, or if you want to contact me for further information or understanding, because normally if I were teaching PowerPoint, and as I have done, I was an adjunct college instructor and taught PowerPoint as part of a computers class I taught for about five years. Usually I would break this down into like maybe six hours of instruction. But so if at some point you feel like we're whip, whisking through things, it's not intended to be a poor presentation, but I want to make sure I cover things. So I hope I've allotted adequate time without overwhelming and giving you time to practice. All right, so we are ready to begin. And I am just going to get my slideshow up. And I have to do it after I share my screen. So here we go. There, and I'm going to start from the beginning. All right, when we create effective slides, we do it for several reasons. It's not just to be a show off, which some people I know did when they first learned PowerPoint. They said, Look at all these transitions I can put in here, or even with Google Slides or whatever you're using. You said, Look what I can make this do, or Oh, what a cool color to use, without understanding that there are design rules. The design rules are typically what you learn if you are in a design development class or if you're working in communications. Since there are so many people now using tools like this to create presentations online, be it a Toastmaster or anybody else, sometimes those individuals or we are not always aware of what the actual basic principles of design include. This is what I will cover along with some recommendations specifically for when you're showing on screen. Sometimes when you show a presentation that's built out of software, PowerPoint, Google Slides, and you're in a room and you're showing it, your dimensions and your choices, the size of things might vary. And I'll note that as we go along. But knowing that we're online, keep that in mind. If you've caught it down below, when we use effective slides, we should accomplish the ability to engage the audience, even if it's just through changing fonts or colors or things that match. It gives you the opportunity to interact with the audience. Later, I'm going to be using question slides there as a demo of how to do that, along with some other tests that we do along the way. Also, it's a better way to keep your audience attention. If you overload a slide, or you overload your presentations with, with too many bells and whistles, or if you keep it generally blah throughout, you aren't going to have people sticking with you. Keep that in mind. As we go, I'll share reasons, tips on how each of the different basic designs will help you to engage, interact. What we'll cover today will include the following. As I shared with you, we are probably covering a lot of information that's usually broken down more specifically. My expectation was to try, is to try to get to all of these as far as animation and transition. It will be reserved to some commentary because that alone can take forever. And given any Q&A time, I will address it at that point. 
We will cover each of these in terms of basics. Effective slides. They use templates for time and design efficiency. How many of you know where to find templates? You can just indicate that in the chat or you can raise your hand. How many of you know how to locate a template? Okay, I'm seeing one, not, not, some of you give me a thumbs up, some of you not. Templates can be found in several places. They can be found within the software itself, such as if you are using PowerPoint, you simply go to the new tab once you open up the program and you will automatically be inundated with possible templates and you can search for them as you see in the search button down below. There are other ways to find templates. Would anybody like to indicate or share? You can just speak out how else you can find a template. What else ever go looking for them? So sometimes I use Canva. Yes, and does Canva offer you templates? Yes. Yes, they do. And mm -hmm. other, other software does the same. Honestly, if I can't find what I want, I'm never ashamed to use, you know, what somebody else has posted. You can simply go online and do a search for it. You can just say template for slide template and type in what you're looking for. There's no problem in borrowing. We are stealing only if the person who posted that template wants you to put credit. So keep that in mind. If you post a template, or you post a picture that belongs to somebody else and you did not find it in the free or free to use images, which by the way, is a whole nother session in itself. Just know that that is something that you need to acknowledge whether you borrow that. Keep that in mind as we go along. When you choose a template, as you can see, you are suddenly thrown with all different types and styles. And sometimes our tendency is to go with our emotion. Right, we go, oh, I really like the blues there. I like that little gadget up in the background. Let's focus in on that reflection on learning and we see some gadgets and wheels. Ask yourself, are gadgets and wheels really anything to do with your Toastmasters presentation? If it's not, then be honest and skip it. Find something where perhaps you can add in your own background image to your template. Many of these can be modified, but I can warn you ahead of time, if you open up any of these, title, reflection, it is nearly, if it's a pre-made template provided by the software manufacturer, there are elements sometimes on that which you cannot delete. So check that out before you begin presenting or choose this, build a bunch of slides and say, okay, now I'll just go back and take some of that out. You sometimes can't. So please be aware of that. And when you search for them, you will notice that sometimes you have subcategories and sometimes I found many things where I said, oh, what a great thing, but I could just remove this and I can't. So check that out ahead of time. It can take some research. At this point, Anybody have a question about searching for a template or just using a template? Just raise your hand or speak out if you do. All right, I think we're good here. What do you think of this template? Simple? How many of you find that this says something to you? Anybody? Yeah, it says something. It says cooperation, working together and coming to an agreement conclusion. That the image resonates that. Right. And does does everybody see the image in the middle? You don't see the image. Okay. All yeah, right. we can see. Okay. Do you see the thank you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the image I'm referencing is this to the left. All right. Is the bond here. And since you can place the word thank you on this template, if you're going to do a thank you presentation, but think about this. Could you simply move this image and people might would get the impression that this is about thanking people? What do you think? Anybody? 
it, it yes. may, but it won't be quite obvious to everyone. Okay. Anybody else agree? If you're saying the image, there's two images, right? There's the background image of what looks like a family or uh, people gathering. There's that foreground image of the handshake with the profiles of the people. That's mm -hmm. there's two different images. When you're exactly. saying image, if you're referring to that sort of logo type image on the lower left, right? That's a that's a different idea from you know whatever uh, you choose in a soft background. Good. Thank you for noting that. Again, if you're going to have a background and you place an image on it, it needs to coordinate. Be careful of that, even though you might be thinking no one's really going to see that. But an image on a slide can definitely say a lot. And if you were speaking to a corporate audience and you simply place that image on the slide and not the thank you, it might be immediate. But an image itself can say a whole lot whether it's the background image or the foreground image. When you are creating your initial effective slides, keep in mind that there's always a question of, is this a slide that needs text or is this a slide that needs an image? Could an image say the thing that the text does or do I need both? So keep that in mind. Those are guideline principles. Sometimes people have a tendency to think, well, if I have an image, I need a lot of words. If I don't have words, maybe I should throw an image in there. Plan what you want to say. Effective slides begin with preparing ahead of time, which means you either make an outline or what we call a storyboard. How many of you, hands up, generally make an outline or a storyboard, which is simply creating blocks. You can do that on a word. How many of you hands up create with a st storyboard or an outline? I'm seeing some, anybody else? Okay, for those of you who have not done it, I highly recommend this can save you lots of time. So in other words, plan what you want to do and then begin building your slides. You can build this out to the point where before you even begin your presentation, you begin selecting your images ahead of time. Say, I'm going to need an image that says this. I'm going to want to use this type of text. But some of the tips I'm going to give today might help you avoid planning lots of different textiles. I highly recommend that if you are planning to use images, instead of just saying, oh, I'll pop in an image, do your research. Find those images before you build it because you might suddenly have all these great ideas and you can't find an image. You can simply find an image in many ways, whether it's by Bing, whatever software browser you're using. Within PowerPoint, you can launch images within Google. You can do the same. So effective slides rely on text or pictures or just one or the other. But keep in mind, people are watching a PowerPoint for a reason. They're not watching it to read it. Got it? We don't watch PowerPoints to read. So what you're going to learn today about text and usage will speak to that. Before we begin, let's think about images. By the way, do you know what these are? Who knows what these are? English muffins or bagels? English okay. muffins, that one. Toastmasters. This is, this is toast. Yes, somebody finally got it. These are Toastmasters. They're not just toasters, they're Toastmasters. Did anybody see that? These are the all time Toastmasters. Toastmaster is a brand of appliance. And I thought how appropriate then to show you Toastmasters, all right, in a different view. I'm also showing you three different images that are varied. One without a border, one with a border. And you could even make that border do all sorts of crazy things, and then I've manipulated the image. Why would I do that to these three different images? Because each image, depending on how you use it, might be ha have a need to change or vary how it looks. You may find that your image on your screen needs a border for some reason, because you have maybe 
a, more text than you expected, and you want your image to stand out. Maybe to complement your presentation, you need to vary the image. You just don't want a plain toaster. How you vary the image, depending on your program, can be done right inside the program. Each of these were manipulated within PowerPoint. Google Slides allows for some manipulation. Canva, depending on whether you have the free version or the professional version, also allows for that. Keep in mind, using effective images and appropriate images are just as important. So as we proceed through this uh, presentation, you are going to have the opportunity to learn more about knowing how to use images and what to do with them. But keep in mind, if you're going to choose an image, it has to have a purpose. Just don't put it there because it looks great. <laughs> so once again, we have image, image, image. What's the purpose of having a border? What's the purpose of varying it? So again, in case you're taking notes, this is why you use an image to illustrate a point, but you might also use it to attract attention. And you'll see that as we proceed into the images section or the image alone makes a statement. Questions at this point? All right, so my question for you is, how many of you have ever thought about using just an image or used just an image to make a point? I've got one person, two people, three people, great. If you've never done it before, Try it, but be aware it should be the precise image. Quite frankly, if I showed you this, I would only have one reason for sticking a Toastmaster oven on here is that I might be asking you, so what's a Toastmaster? And then from there, you can move on. Unless you wanna say, what's the best brand of a, of a toaster? And whatever you do with your images, if you feel the need to do anything to it, be consistent. Meaning, if you're going to add borders around pictures on a slide, do it for all pictures. If you're going to have transitions with slide on pictures, be consistent maybe with the transitions, not just on the slide, but how you transition other pictures. Don't overload your audience with all different ones. The same goes for animation. At this point, we're now going to focus on the different elements, text, images, color. So let's talk about text tips. Text. First rule of thumb with text. Second rule of thumb, third rule of thumb, fourth rule of thumb. First, Generally, no more than six lines on a slide. How many words can you have in that? Well, let's find out. The second text tip. No more than six words on a line. Think about that. The last time that you created a PowerPoint, did you keep each line to six words? Does that mean that you can never have seven or eight? No. Keep in mind though, when you extend it, go back, look at your line and ask yourself, do I really need each word that I have there? Is each word really necessary or could I just shorten that and not use a sentence, but perhaps just bullet those ideas or perhaps just use the portion that makes the most sense. These two, these two rules are very, very critical. So when you are writing your outline or preparing your script, think about what really needs to be said. Third rule of thumb with text, along with 
six lines, six words, avoid long sentences. I know how many of you, how many of you have ever found a sentence or written a sentence into an outline and then simply copied and pasted it into your slide? Let's be honest. Who's ever done that? Anybody want to be honest? I'll be honest. Anybody else? Some of you are not getting, yes, yes. Some of you are being honest. Some of you are just hiding in the background, hoping you don't get noticed, all right? It's easy. And it's easy to think we wrote a great explanation. Again, think carefully. Do I really need to say it? And the final major tip about text. Six lines, six words. Avoid long sentences. Use 24 to 38 bold font. You might be saying, whoa, sometimes I use 18. If, we, if it's too big to fit, then maybe the text is too much. I want you to keep that in mind. If the text is too big to fit, maybe it's too much. Keep, keep that in the back of your mind. Why 28 to 38? because the words are there to help guide you as a presenter. If you are expecting your PowerPoint to be your guide, okay, what do I say next? Oh yeah, that's right, look at my sentence. You're not doing justice to your audience. You are the presenter. PowerPoints are there to illustrate and help support, explain, engage, and help interact. Notice I kept four lines. You can count me up here. You can see that on my first two lines, I have, uh, I think I have seven, okay? And like I said, you can go that way, but I kept the other ones short. If I had done all four lines of text here with lines that were seven words a piece, by now your eyes would be exploding. I also want you to think back how I did this. I didn't just roll all these out, one, two, three. I kept reverting back and forth to a visual of sorts. And I did that on purpose because I wanted you all to hear these again and again and again. There was a method here. I want you to have this ingrained in your head next time you create this. If you have a software program open, whether it's Canva, Google Slides, or whatever. I want you to take a moment, if you would, please, and just pick a word. Pick the word Toastmaster. That might be a great word. Open up a slide and write it in 24 bold font. Take a look at it. See what it looks like. And then copy that same word paste it and put it in 38 bold font. And if you've done that, now ask yourself, how many words could you put on a line if each word is at 24 and each word is at 38? And I'm looking for answers here. Can anybody tell me or willing to share with me how many words could you get on a line if you use 24 point font? Anybody do it? Nobody has an answer? Speak up. Juanita, it looks like you're working on it, are you? You're muted. Can you tell us? Can you uh, unmute and tell us? Four. About four. Four, four at what? 24 at, or 38? At 24. At 24, it gets big, right. What I used here is 22. 38 might be even larger. So keep that in mind, all right? Now I'm going to show you three slides. So it's time for you to pick or comment on some slides here that use text. Now that you've learned these rules, you'll notice that each slide is lettered. I have A, I have B, I have C, and I have D. All right, let me show you those again. This is D, this is C, 
This is B and this is A. All right, let's vote in the chat. Out of A, B, C, and D, which one do you like the most? Type in A, B, C, or D. I'm seeing a lot of Ds or D, but some people like A because they like reading. All right, I'm reading from the chat. It's B, somebody went with B. All right, we're going to go back through these. All right, oops, somebody likes A. Okay. All right, very good. Now let's type in the one that you least like. All right, should I review the slides again? I'll see if you're able to type them in. All right, I'm seeing A and B, least like, A and B. Okay. Yes, I know I can put this slide, all of these on one slide. Okay, some people not liking C. All right, very good. Very good. I'm just going to close up the chat for the moment. And let's take a look at this. Text slide A in, in relationship to the text rules that you learned, why would this slide probably be the least or the most likely slide not to impress? Can anybody share a reason? Too yes, much to read. Too much to read. What about the our font is too small. Too small Font's font. too small. What else did you learn? We're going to be spending more time reading this than listening to you. So you might as well not talk. <laughs> there you go. And on top of that, are we following the six words per line? No. Nope. Absolutely not. This font is probably at about 14 or 18. Okay, let's take a look at B. All right, B, B, some people liked. I'm guessing it might be because it caught their attention with the color. But if the idea is to look at the slide and learn, tell me what's happening here that makes this slide difficult to read. It's too busy. Changes the font in the color. Font styles. Font styles. What else? Too the many size. buttons. The sizes vary all over the place. The colors are there. Too many too colors. Right. One thing this person, this creator did follow is when it comes to rules of text, what's one rule this or two rules that were followed here? Can you tell me? The number of words. Two words. The number of words on the line and the fact that it shouldn't be more than how many lines of text? Six. 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 We're, we're good with that. And you might say, well, I can read that. But believe me, if I'm going to speak from this slide and this is staring at you for a while, my eyes would start blinking rapidly. Anybody agree with me? Yes, yeah. your face is also turned green from this slide. <laughs> yes, thank you. That green background. <laughs> yeah. All right, and C. What's wrong with this slide? Why wouldn't this, does this follow the rules of text? Six lines, less than That's six? Four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is going on in this slide that makes it difficult to read? It looks fuzzy. Contrast. It's fuzzy. Fuzzy. Yep. The contrast. It looks like we're throwing in shadows in there as well. All right. Did we follow anything? We followed the six line. What about the font size? Is that accurate? Does that look to be at least 24? It is. Okay. Nice. But yet it's not effective. It seems to be following all the rules. So again, if you're going to use text, Make sure it's clear. Make sure it's consistent. I don't know if you caught this, but do you see how the second line begins with a capital? What do you notice about the no. third line? What's off? No, no caps. No, no cap. cap, but yet the last word is capitalized. It's inconsistent on top of everything. So text consistency is very important. So when we talk about fonts, which is coming up, I want you to think about font choice, very important to think about. And D was the preference. Why do you like D? Uh, uh, Anybody? I like I actually like Anybody, tell me a reason for liking D. What makes it engage you? The blue and white 
is what made me the backgrounds like in the back and then the words awesome words right stuck out to me yeah anybody else what do you think of the font on awesome words do you like the font it like makes it. a statement yes it does and it's large enough and yes, it's a little, it's not the type of font that you would want to use for all lines of text because it's all caps. And we're going to learn about that too, like when to use all caps and why you shouldn't be using all caps. So at this point, there is a lower line of text, but this perhaps might be the presenter using this lower line, having it fly in, and then speaking from that point not necessarily repeating what can be read, but perhaps launching this and saying, the image here are the key words that I want you to remember, and then go on and speak about audience attention and how you keep audience attention. Perhaps you're doing um, a presentation on word choice. Any questions at this point? All right, okay, at this point, I'm gonna take a quick survey. Anybody want to raise your hand if you've learned something new up to this point? Anybody willing to give me some feedback? Feedback or raise your hand in the chat? Okay. Thank you for those who are engaging. Okay. All right. So now let's check your knowledge. All right. You ready? Time to interrupt. Obviously, this will be a true false question. An effective slide can contain up to 50 words. Please put your answer in the chat. Yes, true or false? Yeah, false. Ah, primarily false, right? Very good. Let's close up that survey. And let's check false because that's the preferred choice. Yay, you did it. False is the correct answer. Although we usually don't say correct, you're false. It's kind of a conundrum, <laughs> but definitely catches some attention there, I think. <laughs> All right, very good. You got it. Okay, next question. An effective slide contains text that is at a minimum of 24 point bold. There, okay, true, true, true. Good, good, glad to see you're engaging, true. All right, knowing that, let's check our true answer. Correct, you're true. At this point, now we're going to talk about abbreviations very briefly. How many of you have ever seen a slide that's full of abbreviations? Perhaps looking like this. Anybody? Have you ever seen abbreviations on a slide? No? Okay, some of you have. It might not be that you get too many abbreviations. What might be the issue is, can anybody tell me when you see an abbreviation, what might be the issue? You might not know what it is. But, yeah, your audience <laughs> might not be privy to <laughs> that information, <laughs> such as DCP. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go, yes. Or let me ask you, how many of you, when you first joined Toastmasters, and you might have been to a training and somebody showed you a slide or just bannered about the, the abbreviation DTM. How many of you, when you first joined Toastmasters, kept asking yourself, what the heck is a DTM? <laughs> yep, that was me. I kept saying, what is that? What is that? And it was odd because people in my club had no idea either. So I guess that's what forced me to go to a lot more district events so I could learn what it was and meet one. But again, you're right. And you also have to think about, am I using the abbreviation correctly? That's also a consideration. I want you to think about that. 
just because you like to use initials between states like P double P period A, that is no longer the correct way to abbreviate. I still mm -hmm. see people doing that. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, if you're under 30 years old, which, okay, I'm not, all right? But if you're <laughs> under that, I, I can almost assure you that the way anybody under 30 recognizes an abbreviation for, for a state is without periods. Not that they can't figure it out, but keep in mind, if you're gonna put something on the screen, let's make sure it's accurate. All right, so abbreviations. Now, I have just obliterated my rule. Do you see that? What did I just do on this slide that obliterated my rule of text? More than six lines and six words and... It seems like that on, yes. Although if we focus on each of these individually, I kept it down, right? But for purposes of letting you know that I don't want to spend tons of time on abbreviations, all right, I kept the, everything condensed. What you should also notice is everything that's up here are very common abbreviations. So in other words, I'm not expecting you, you can probably just take a quick skim of these, can you not? And just say, yep, I know what those stand for. Uh, unless you are suddenly interested in, well, what does AM or PM or AD actually mean? In which case, if I were doing an entire lesson on the correct ways to abbreviate, I might stop, focus on each of these. My purpose here is to say to you, if you are going to talk and use abbreviations, it's not about just you knowing the correct abbreviation, it's about you knowing if your audience knows those abbreviations. If I were talking with high school students, I can clearly inform you, and you may be shocked to know this, most high school students have no idea what a BA or BS or an MA is. You might banter that about unless they've been educated by their parents. I can also assure you that I know teenagers, who, unless they take the cooking class or were taught at home, they have no idea what a gallon or a pound or a pint is. In fact, it's time to share a funny story. I think we need a little break. So let me tell you a story that was shared in my high school faculty room by our consumer science teacher who said, here's what happened today. The recipe called for one egg. They were make, the group was making cookies. So into the batter went one egg, <laughs> one entire egg. Shell. All, right? And they couldn't understand why their batter looked like it as it did when they called the teacher over who said she saw all these little flicks and realized it was shells. Never assume anything about your audience. Assume, and that applies also to what you put on your PowerPoint and what you use. Again, these are very common or what you might expect, but I've just pointed out two situations. The same way that when I entered retirement or started thinking about retirement from public education, I was inundated with abbreviations all over the place because I retired from the state. And if I watched a presentation filled with these abbreviations, I was hoping they would teach them to me. Very important to consider that. At the bottom of this slide, and I'm happy to share it with you, here is a link to where you can find a list of commonly used abbreviations. If you're wondering, is this a common abbreviation or could I use it or do I need an explanation? I'm not sure what it means. Check your resources, just as you should be checking image and so forth. Let's move on to punctuation marks. First of all, let me ask you, what do you think about the colors on this slide? Anybody want to speak out? I don't like them. Why? <laughs> they're, they're, they don't complement one another. You want a contrast, but you want the contrast to complement the other color. They're, it's they're too also, distracting. Okay. Color wheel opposites as well. Oh, thank you for noting that. We're going, to, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Anybody else want to say something about these? 
I have to tell you, every time I see pink and green, it takes me back to when I was about 14. And it was the first time ever in the fashion world. Or no, maybe I was about 16. Doesn't matter. Fashion world introduced the idea of wearing pink and green together. Anybody present ever remember that color combo as being all over your clothes? What do you mean? It's in the bathrooms, much older bathrooms. Yes. That pink tile. Yep, because it comes out of that generation and pink and green. And it was adopted by, I think it was ICOST, if you remember. And all and it, and it ushered in in the late, especially in the 80s, early 80s, it ushered in the preppy generation. If you can recall, the original preps were pink and green. That's where yeah. it goes with me. But everything else you've said is true. And I simply wanted to note that as a preview to the fact that we're going to look more deeply into color usage. What Leslie, you there's a sorority that colors are pink and green. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Do they wear, do they have like a solid pink jacket with green around it? Or? They have varied decorations for whatever, sweatsuits, mainly pink. And then the writings, it, it changes depending on what it is, but their, their colors are pink and green. So you know that they're an AKA. Yeah. Are you a sor? Is that your sorority? No, okay. but most of my friends are. Okay. And what do you think of those colors? When I saw them, I said, oh, unless you're an alpha, unless you're an AKA, you would not like that slide. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Well, let, let me draw your attention down to the bottom. What you see there are some frequent punctuation marks, but maybe not so frequent. We definitely recognize some of them. The other ones, I know for sure, if I ask somebody to use brackets, they get confused. Do I use this one right here or do I use this one right here? Again, be aware, not everybody knows every punctuation mark when we think about these as in the same way that we think about abbreviations. Here again, does this look like an atrocity of a slide? Wanted to throw in my word for the day. Anybody disagree that this is an atrocity? I don't think so. We got blurred, we've got too many colors and we've got punctuation mark. The only positive aspect, can anybody find one positive aspect about this slide? The color choices are accommodating because there's, there's no repeat of colors. Well, there we go. If you want the rainbow effect, you've got yeah. that. What else might be good about this slide? That it I has like all the different possible punctuation things that we're likely to encounter can i add that yeah most people would know these most you know most people would recognize these does anybody else think there's anything good the Did word you? punctuation is in the proper size thank you for noting that and it's big enough and it's you know at the top of the screen and the okay. contrast is good on that line Yes. Would anybody not use this? Would anybody want to use this slide? I did not think so. All right. I'd be a little concerned if you did. You know, I, I think I would use it, but without the small text beneath in the box. Ah, like, if you just right. have the, the, the mark and the word, and then the speaker would talk to each one, that, that it would work in that case. Anybody want to elaborate even beyond that? We're removing the text below the word. Anybody think there's something else you could easily do to improve this slide? This is a good example, I think, of where you said, do you need the word if you have the image? Thank you, Katie. You're right. You could, since these are frequently recognized, just use the image. I disagree with that. Do you? Why do you disagree with us? Um, because non-native speakers may, you know, need to understand what the name of the punctuations are in English. Good. So, so I think the, the the punctuation name association is, to me, is the primary point of this slide. All the rest of the junk, the small text and everything else is bad. And of course, everything is blurry. And I, yeah, I have to agree with Gus. I think it'll depend on what your audience is, too. So if it's, you know, for folks that you're just kind of reviewing with them or for folks who don't understand, I think it'll depend on knowing your audience, which yes, is an yes. important part of this as well. You yeah. are right. Young May's nodding enthusiastically to that. Yes. But yeah. she, but you're right. 
again, you have to think, as we've already talked about, audience is the primary focus. It's not about you, all right? Remember that. When you're creating something, why are you doing it? Let's move on. Little test. Who can find the errors? When you do use punctuation, we want to be sure you're using it accurately. Who could spot some errors on this slide? Too many to type into the, to the chat window. Okay, let's just, you wanna shout them out? The question mark, the, the punctuation. You know, the first, the first exclamation point should have been a comma, right? It's twinkle, comma, twinkle, little, right. you don't need that star how no question mark there i wonder what you are and you know the question mark is supposed to appear there how i wonder what you are no no, no i think that's fine okay. and then and then um the up should have been capitalized guess the beginning of another sentence up above yeah. the world so high so no comma needed there no <laughs> comma after so i mean no period after so so basically every bloody punctuation you've got there is all screwed up okay thank you Thank you. There's thank not you. one that's correct. You're right. And thank you for being a co-presenter there. I appreciated that. It saved me trying to get everybody to, to identify. What I noticed was when everybody, when you first looked at this slide, maybe nobody else had this experience. When you first looked at the slide, did it look okay to you? Like, it, no. Okay. No. Some people are nodding yes, because where did your focus go, young man? I'm going to call you out. I see you nodding. Um. Um, yeah, the background, it's kind of the layout is kind of attractive and the font kind of uh, very and fun looking, fun looking. So I, I was attracted to those visual elements, not necessarily the text and the quotation marks. Okay. Did anybody look at this and just say right away, oh, I know what that says, and then have moved on? When any, because everybody knows twinkle, twinkle, little star. Would anybody have done that? Anybody? Okay. That was too small. I didn't even try to read it. Oh, okay. There's no, another yeah. key. And it's smashed onto the slide, is it not? It's very. So punctuation, consider this. When you use, it's not only about being accurate. It's about the fact that punctuation is provided to help readers make sense of words. And I've long taught that when I taught grammar for many, many years. When you are questioning what kind of punctuation or do I need it, punctuation is there to help the reader. Do you want them to pause or don't you? Is it necessary to separate or not? More importantly, is, the import, is it important to make the punctuation stand out? And I'm sure some of you noted, but nobody brought that up. We all, all of the punctuation marks are like in this pinky rose, red, depends on how it's showing on your screen. Why, you know, why do that? unless you're trying to teach punctuation. And yeah. in this point, this was a good slide to demonstrate that. Does everybody see the connection to what I'm making here? Think about it carefully. It, but if you ask a question on a slide, by all means, put a question mark there. Review your slides to make sure they're accurate. So think about all this in terms of punctuation. How about this slide? How do you like the use of punctuation mark here? What do you like about it? Does anybody, all right, anybody? Juanita, looks like you're chatting. It, it made me laugh. <laughs> okay. Because it's cutesy, yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Again, Choose when we talk about, you know, fonts, you got to make sure that they're correctly used. Anybody else noticing with the fonts there? If you are talking about individual part punctuation marks, this is a great demonstration. We do have the text aligned as it should be. The text is a little bit small. So again, you'd have to ask yourself, do I need the punctuation? Can I do it just with a punctuation mark and speak to the slide? Or as an educator, if I were teaching somebody punctuation and keep this in mind for your own presentation, if you, are, if you have a statement that you think is important for people to note, write down, I'd say it's perfectly fine to use exclamation there. Again, it's about your audience and the purpose. 
There is nothing wrong with writing out a sentence and putting on a slide if it's a statement that you want people to record or remember. You can say it, but we all know that when people see things, it makes a more lasting impression than just saying it. Now that we've learned a little bit more about the, considering your abbreviations and noticing we don't need to make punctuation stand out, we should use it when we should, knowing the text rules that we have learned, let's consider fonts. Some people get over excited about fonts, right? They get in there and you get that drop down list or you start choosing a font and you're like, ooh, I like this one, right? Presentations are not the place to show your creativity or your playfulness unless you've got an audience who is looking for inspiration or if you have a genuine purpose for varying up your fonts. Let's learn about fonts. How many of you were blinking before you read this? Anybody blinking before you read it? All right, I've got some honest people give, okay, giving me, yep. And then when you finally read it, it says what it means, right? Fancy fonts are hard, can be hard to read. And they are. Now you might argue and say, well, if you took the red shadowing out behind it, what do you think? It's still, it's filled with what we call, does anybody know what type of type this is? When you have all those little cues and curly cues sticking up there, what do we have there? We have um, serfs. Serfs, yeah. right. And, we and it's filled with it. Serfs are fine to use. You're going to learn that, but you have to choose carefully on what you use. So in, to ensure readability, there is a list of recommended fonts. And there are not, and you're not, the good news is you're not limited to like one or two, all right? Or even three or four, or even six, like you are for lines of text. What you see here, and if you wanna take a screen print of this or come back or get a list later, or have me send them to you, uh, print view. These are the recommended font. Notice, if you do, how many notice, does anybody notice why, what's, common on the left versus what's in common on the right? There are no right. serfs on the left. Right. Yeah. It's all, and those are all your variations. Remember too that, and I'm sure you've noted this, but keep it in mind, when you change to different fonts, it will change the size or the amount of text you can actually put on a line. On the left there, every single font is in this, every single font is the same size. But when you look at it, you might question that and say, no, it's not. Like Calibri, which is often recommended for text, when you're writing text and you just want text, Calibri is a very common use. Did any, can anybody pick from that list which font I've been using so far other than on this slide? Does anybody know which font I've been using in text where I wrote out myself? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Corbell. Corbell is correct. I heard it. Yes, Corbell. And it may not be one that pops up on your list when you're usually writing a document. It's not often there. But Corbell is clean and simple. Keep in mind something like Tahoma, Gilsons, and Century Gothic. Little more decorative is the way I would say that. Reserve those for titles on slides and things that you, words that you want to emphasize. But when you are writing or composing, keep that in mind. Now let's look at the ones that are more um, artistic, right? More descriptive because of type that they are. Can anybody identify when you might want to use something like Palatino? or Garamond. When yeah. might you want to use that? Anybody? I hear somebody. I use Garamond for my resume. Okay. You use it for a resume. Yeah, a more formal document, yeah. Yes. It's more formalized. Palantino is less formalized. But again, if you're showing it for visual purposes, limit the amount of usage. If you're going with a serif type, 
I prefer Georgia. What you might find though, is you don't need to use Georgia at the same type size as others. So keep in mind that when you, when you choose a text type, even though the recommendation is 24, 28 to 32, you may find that you can reduce that text size and say, okay, I feel safe, I'm not breaking any rules. So make your decisions wisely, think about that. And if you haven't, um, yes, yeah, somebody's noticing that sometimes it, it, your program defaults. In a Word document, if you're using Word, it will often. On Google Docs, it does not default to Times New Roman, it often defaults to something else. This is why developing a presentation requires you to really think about what's showing up on your screen as you present it and plan ahead of time. Try out these fonts. So at this point, I'm gonna ask those of you who did open up a program, or if you just wanna open up a document, whether it's a Google document or not, I'd like you to type, type in the word Toastmasters and, key, and copy it and then try out some of these fonts and use 24 points, 28 points. So let's just take a break and allow you to do that and see what these look like. Is anybody trying out a font you've never used before? Yeah, Corbell. Okay, what do you think of Corbell? I like that. Yeah, anybody else trying out something like Garamond or Palatino? I use that one. I do like that Corbell thing. Mm. It's very clean, I, love, I, I do like that. And I've never seen that font, so thank yeah. you. Okay, good. I have a comment. I, I'm working with a PowerPoint from 2007. Yes. And I very rarely go in to use that, but I noticed its default is Calibri. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And Calibri, as you see, is on the list. Calibri is another nice font, but notice it's the smallest in size. So you may, you do have to consider how big do I need to go with my Calibri? All right, just keep that in mind. And that's something you wanna try out. I encourage you, try these out. I like Century Gothic for titles at times. Again, if I'm using say, uh, a type font like Tahoma versus Verdana, I'm looking probably for a simpler and I'm tailoring it to my content. Think about what your content is about. Is it, If this is serious content and you are talking about a subject outside of just Toastmaster training that requires seriousness, think carefully about that font. Do you want it to be glitzy and decorative or don't you? Yeah, that's true. I use, I do presentations for a youth group and for young kids that are from five to 12 years old and they have to read. So okay. I try to pick a plain, simple font so that they won't have trouble seeing it. And right. Reading. Readability is important as well as what your subject is. Make them match. Now, as we enter into color, oh, Audrey, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Just wondering if it's advisable to have several different fonts on a slide. We're going to get to that, okay? Thank you. Very quickly. All right, just a little preview to coming up with color. I have a purple background. I have a very pale blue background. I have a white background. And I have a bullseye saying you picked it. All right. So look at these again. Which one do you prefer? This background? This background? Or this background, which is a little more blue. Anybody? C. Anybody? C, blue. C, hey, B, no blue. The, the lighter blue. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
definitely. Be careful when you use black on white. It may not always be exactly what you want, okay? All right, let's move on. What I want you to notice specifically now on this slide is what do you notice? What have I done to all the text? All uppercase. Yeah. Do we want to use all uppercase? Not all the time. No. Only for emphasis and only maybe for one word or maybe two or if it's a phrase. Other than that, you don't know where to put your attention. It's a formalization technique, but it's also an engagement technique. So be yeah. careful with that. Perhaps only on slide titles, but right. that's typically not within the body of the slide. Right. And I've got my blinking eyeball to let you know that that's the same thing that I do when I see text like this. It can cause as much distraction as all those colors. All right. And then again, here's somebody who got playful with text. See what happens? And not only that, every single type text font here, all is out of the norm, not simple, fancy script. Again, don't overload. Don't get too enthusiastic about all your fonts if you're just discovering them. All right, so how many fonts on a slide? I'd say one or two. Two, That's maybe three, okay? Keep your fonts consistent. If you are going to use two font types or three for titles in addition, keep that without your entire presentation. Do not start mixing up your different uh, fonts on every slide. Otherwise, the reader starts to lose the message. Being consistent is incredibly important, right? You want to keep those fonts consistent and limit them. Again, don't let your creativity or your fun and enthusiasm get the best of you. Size of fonts. Take a look at this. It's a question. We've talked about it. 28 to 32. Which side do you prefer? The left or the right? The right. The right? Yep, yes. the right. What happens on the right? Subliminally, you put a check mark so we knew to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> well, your eyes, I you mean, know, I read somewhere before that our eyes physically cannot read things that are all in caps. That's exactly right. So when we have the top, Part that says size fonts appropriately. How many words do I have there? Three. And that's what I said. If I went more than three, you probably would have lost the message by now. It's all about what these slides are trying to say. And then below that, you are sticking with all your text rules. The only thing that I might question on this, do you question it? Notice that the top font, no serif. Bottom is serif, mm -hmm. right? Think carefully, it's, a, it's not, but it's a little, it's a different type of type, right? So yeah. think carefully when you use different fonts, do they complement each other? They're there, if you're going to use different fonts, why? And if you're going to use fonts that are really small and size-wise, you're going to change down, this slide on the left has a purpose, right? The slide on the, the left works to get the message across because you are being asked to think about are fonts too big or too small? So by using the too small, we got the message across. And in that case, it works. But again, if you're going to vary your type size, if you're going to vary your type font, why? Keep that in mind. All right, lessons learned so far on fonts, because we covered quite a bit. You want to maintain consistent use of two or three fonts. You want to refrain from using all caps. 
You want to avoid text overload. And you want to use preferred fonts as listed. Again, if you just want to take a screenshot for those of you who are newer at this as reminder rules, or unless you've written them down, that's fine by me. Okay. All right. Quick, quick test here. True or false again. An effective slide contains only serif fonts. Ooh, I had a typo. Rather than rather than say on serif fonts. <laughs> My apologies. Told you Murphy's Law is in effect. It's there. All right. Okay. What's the answer? Should it contain false. only serif fonts rather than sans serif? True or false? False. Okay. False, 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 false. Good job. Good job. Okay. For time's sake, I'll just pause it. Pause. False is correct. Yahoo, Yahoo. All right. Next question. An effective slide should contain a maximum of three different fonts. True or false? All right. Put your answer in chat. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of trues. Yeah, you are correct. Told you I had a glitch here. Sorry about that. I gotta back out for just a moment. I thought I had this fixed when I made this. All right, what we're going to move in here to really quickly because time is going and I was mm. concerned about this. So we're going to talk about images. Images on this slide, a lot, a lot of images all through here. Sometimes having all these images okay, makes sense. Sometimes it does not. To me, this is image overload. Hmm. I would agree. Again, what's your message? Why do you have that image? This one's a little simpler, a little cleaner. And why you might say, well, there's a lot, there are a lot of images there. There might be a reason. If this was being part of a corporate presentation and your idea was to talk about each of those elements you see in a circle, this would be a great preview slide. Hopefully after this, it would tone down. So let's see how we use images in a slide. When you look at this slide on the don't, can anybody tell me what's wrong with, why is the slide on the left a don't slide? Anybody? Well, there's no consistency in terms, you use the, a more of a live person, a photo, and then the bottom one is sort of a sketch clip art. Clip, clip art. Clip art, yes. You are correct. You don't want to use clip art and a live photo. Here's the reality check. In today's day and age, most people do not use clip art anymore unless I suppose you're talking or you're building a cartoon effect. And there is definitely a time, place, and audience for a cartoon effect. On the right, we see the same amount of text and the picture is placed a little larger. Please avoid clip art when you can. All right, next, don't and do. What's, how about the left side versus the right side? What's the big, what's the big indicator here? What are we doing? Why do they have those images of the hand and the something at the top? Right. And essentially, the main difference between the don't and the do is what? Simplicity. Clutter. And one image. Right. If one image does it, use one image. All right. Another do, don't and do with text. What do you notice that's different here? The device is in that shadow box, which 
don't need. So if you go out and you get an image from the internet, from Bing search, many a time they show up with these images with backgrounds or you clip it in and you're like, what can I do with that? In PowerPoint, you can edit photos. The photos that I showed you earlier with the Toastmasters, right? I edited all of those within PowerPoint. I do use Photoshop quite a bit, but if I can do it right within the program, I do. Each of the programs that you might work, work with probably have various limitations, various options. If you can't find an image that works simply, don't use it, especially if you're trying to impress your audience. All right, so you want to keep the image clean to help the viewer focus. Now, do you see what's wrong here? You have to look carefully, unless you notice my red arrow, what's going on? What's the problem here on the left versus the right? The mirror image of it. Yep, and it's going in the wrong direction, okay? So if you flip a picture to make it fit, Make sure it fits in the right direction. All right, so let's look at this series of images. What's different between the don't and the do? The so don't, she's pointing off the screen and the do, she's pointing to the text. Exactly, again, be careful, mm -hmm. edit carefully. And if you're going to rotate an image, be, be sure it rotates in the direction you want. All right, another set. Now, even then you might be saying, well, these aren't the best examples. You're right. But if you're going to do it, why the right and not the left? What's different? The don't has an arrow pointing to the image, to the picture and it's not necessary. Okay. I put that, that's on the there to show that's you that's the problem the area. All right, so what is the problem with the image? Can anybody tell us? The image is it's totally too unrelated it's to too the text long. visually. Yeah. Yes, you there. don't need all the sofa. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's it not matter. clear, and why is it stuck at the bottom? If you're going to have white space on a slide, which is not recommended, make sure your image that you do use is prominent. What's happening here? The one on the right is basically identifying why you have those other images. It has a central focus with the word fruits. You don't want to have a text that you know doesn't say what create a cohesiveness. Okay, and it overlaps. Oh, what do you notice together. about the images on the right versus the images on the left? They're larger. Slightly yes, more. they're zoomed in. Right, they're zoomed in. So keep in mind that you can zoom in on a picture. And again, you can do that on your own images, especially if you want them to take it in and really think about it. The photo on the, on the right, I feel like I'm immersed in fruit, all right? And I imagine that's the idea, all right? If I'm not feeling fruity after that one, all right? This one over here, you got all that extra white space. Think about balance. When you put images, and notice this is more than one or two or three, this is four. But in this case, four work because they're all unified and highly relevant to one another. And think again, what's my message? What's my message? Let's consider text and images together. We've been looking at images and ignoring the text because what we saw with the text really wasn't working. This is better, but why is the one on the right better than the one on the left? Anybody? Well, um, the purpose, if you were saying you're demonstrating working together, you want, you want them to get that first and then the image as opposed to looking at the image and then figuring out what, what it's supposed to say at the bottom. That's okay. what I think. Right. So the, the title of the slide, the most important message is to the top. 
What about the coloring? Proper contrast makes it pop yeah. out. Exactly, exactly. And this is where we start looking more seriously at color choice. And I know time is going, so mm -hmm. I'm going to move a little faster, all right? Just for the sake of everybody getting this. All right. And this one, I just wanna show you finally, I like this slide. I did not create it, I borrowed it. It's a little, I, I blew it up. I know it's a little bit fuzzy, but I like the fact that it's using two, it's using basically, it's using a, a split background and it's using what I would call our three image, two different types of images, the picture to the left and then the number signs. So why I also, another point of demonstration here is you can make your text into an image itself. The text can actually say the message. So for time's sake, we're not going to talk about it, but I would certainly hope that if you saw this, you would say, I need to get in there and do some major surgery on these slides, as I like to say. Yeah. All right, and again, another. this is a great example of where your text almost becomes an image in itself. But again, they're consistent. I really only have two types of engines, the one on the left and the two on the right, and we're maintaining three. Great example of a balanced slide using text and images. Cut it real quickly, true or false. An effective slide contains images to complement or express a single message. Let's just shout it out. True or true. false? True. 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 Yep. True. Okay. True is correct. Next question. An effective slide avoids using clip art. True or false? True. 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 Yep, you guys are just blown right along, as I expected you would be. All right, so real quickly on color. Do we use color or not? When necessary to make use a point. Use it, Oh, my God. Yeah. Yikes, right? That's we, my must, thought right away, all right? Let's be talking okay. about rainbows. When it yes, enhances. yes, that's yeah. serious yeah. rainbow yeah. effect. And again, it can be reserved for particular uses. All right. So I'm going to show you a series of slides with different backgrounds. And this actually was borrowed from a presentation or a, a web, uh, an article about the psychology of color, just to know, just to let you know, I didn't make all this up and it's legit. So when you feel, when you see blue, are you feeling blue? To people, blue might mean sad, but that's not really the intent. Blue is a comforting, calming color and it's great for business presentations. Green, when you see green, are you feeling comfy? This green might be a little bright, but green should kind of make you, hmm, like feel comfortable in your surroundings. Not necessarily excited, not necessarily so relaxed, you're gonna feel as, fall asleep, but green's purpose is to make you feel comfortable in what, in, in your surroundings and to have people just kind of relate to the material with it as it goes. I was checking my notes. Green also should make you feel friendly. It's a great background to use when you might be presenting content that might be creating conflict. Think about that. All right. You seeing red here, <laughs> right? Is your heart pounding? That's what we know about red. That's why businesses are advised to use red. It's a highly engaging, attractive color, but you've got to use it sparingly, all right? Red has a lot of cultural implications. Be careful of it. You know, mm -hmm. red in red talking to a medical group, that's danger, right? Alarm. To other people, they see red as if you're talking about romance, this might be the color you want. But if you're trying to convince medical personnel to be more passionate and romantic on the job, red may not be your best choice. Okay. Next one, purple. All right. Purple is often with royalty. You may might be like, why use purple? Well, purple is when you want people to be feeling their emotions. I didn't say get emotional, but feeling intense, like they're ready to deep down inside. Actually, I use purple for a presentation I made 
regarding domestic violence. And you will see that often. So if it's a passion, if it's a topic that is about a spiritual event or getting, you know, investigating emotions, use purple. Yellow. That is one bright yellow. Are you feeling anxious? Anybody getting that sensation? Feeling a little bit like, ah, okay. <laughs> well, I could tell you what yellow is often associated with, but I'll leave that out not to make anybody nervous, but yellow, yellow is only used in situations where you are talking about something that is mm, going to promote questions, okay, going to promote curiosity, so think about that, all right, black has a place, black is great, for neutral material, things you don't want people to get emotional about. Data, finances, statistics, great use for that. Just gets people focused on the text and what you wanna talk about. And finally, white. White is great for feeling positive. You want people to focus feeling light. If you contrast it with black, you might get a different emotion. If you contrast the white with blue, green, or purple, think about what you just learned. And then in regard to colors, as was noted by a participant earlier, when you use color, warm colors are often preferred. They're not as obtrusive. They don't clutter up your screen. They don't draw attention. But there are occasions when you do want to use what we call cool colors. And again, there is a color wheel that you can reference most often, and it's always there when you go to change font, image, color, border, anything like that. You will have the option to choose from the color wheel, not just necessarily what was shown to you as options, just single options. So investigate your color wheel. So mixed colors, color, cool colors. All right, so this is a test. What's happening to you? Let me show you that again. I meant to repeat it. What was happening? What's wrong with, what happens when you look at that? Makes me um, anxious or alarming me. Alarming, anxious, right? And if I flash it and everything else, and I don't know, is anybody thinking Christmas when you see that? For holidays, you might be. Be careful, cultural implications of color. Keep colors simple and to the point of the message. And again, same slide, just varied the color. A subtle difference, and there might be a reason for that. I just wanted you to think about color. All right, quickly, true, false. An effective slide contains a maximum of three different colors. True or false? Shout out. True. 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 Yes. Correct. Next question. An effective slide uses cool colors to calm the audience. True or false? True. 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 That, was... that is false. Mm. Cool colors are your bright, like alarming, bright greens, bright reds those deep purples, keep in mind cool colors. Look at your color wheels when you open them up. If you feel warm and fuzzy, you got a warm color. If it's shocking or alarming, so be careful on your use of cool colors. I think some of the, the confusing thing was we talked about the cool colors being calming, but then we talked about the warm colors being better for presentations. I think maybe that was like- an right. Right, so if you choose to use a cool color in the background, keep in mind what your purpose is, All right? Now, when I say background, rarely are you gonna end up with a slide that you constantly have a whole blotch of purple behind it with just white words, unless you're doing a review, a quick review, and you just wanna punch out a few words on each slide. But most often, if you're creating a presentation, 
and you are going to be placing images and text and you maybe just want a gradient feel. You can always do a gradient feel with a slide where it just subtly brings in ranges. So you're right, Katie, when you have too much of the color all the time, it's not effective no matter what you're using, unless you're staying with your blacks or your blues. So you make a good valid point. I appreciate that. All right, at this point, I'm simply sharing with you uh, each of the available software online that is frequently used. If you're not familiar with these, I will simply identify um, a key point about each. To the left is Captivate, that's created by Adobe. You do have to buy an entire Captivate program. You can't even get it through the Creative Cloud if you're using that. It's a separate cost and I use it, but I use it because I use it for professional purposes. It's often used to create educational training and you can interact with your quizzes much more effectively. The next one is Adobe Spark. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. I love it. You can use it for free. You can also buy a premium subscription. But what this focuses on is it gives you pre-made templates, not just for PowerPoints or slides, but for presentations, flyers, and it has wonderful templates already created with a variety of images, which you can easily take out, add in, and change the text. I, it's one of my favorite go-tos. The next one is Keynote. Keynote is created for Mac users or iPad. What I do use, I'm, I've grown up being a PC user. When I say grown up, it's when I became a digital migrant, by the way. Um, when I became a digital immigrant, um, I came in and I was not using Macs. I was using PCs. I have access to a Keynote. So if somebody wants to work with me on Keynote, I can do that. Google Slides, excellent, free, just doesn't have as many options as PowerPoint, which I used for this presentation but a lot can be accomplished, depends on what you wanna do. Prezi, if you're not familiar with it, Prezi builds presentations for you. What Prezi is known for is their animation and their transitions, which are already built in. Notice we didn't do a lot of talk about transition because transitions can be annoying. You don't need them to go from slide to slide. If you notice, I did not necessarily have transition. Sometimes I just brought up the gray slide background, which by the, in case you didn't notice, I used a gray background because I did not want to detract, but I wanted it subtle. Yeah, so keep in mind, if you use Prezi, that Prezi has built-in backgrounds. You can change them, but a lot of transitioning. And I did not transition because I just gave you a moment to breathe, right? Canva, a lot of people are into mm -hmm. Canva now. Again, Canva, you can have a premium subscription that you pay for. The main reason for buying the premium I've learned with Canva is if you want to download and save, you cannot download and save a file on Canva. You have to present right from your browser. That can lead to some glitches if you don't have access or suddenly you lose your connection. And Powtoon is when you do want to use cartoons or images. Powtoon will create like simple little cartoon images or you can drag images. Again, they look like clip art, but sometimes there can be a reason to use just one piece of clip art or maybe a cartoon is just a way to break up your slide, all right? So at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing. I know I'm over time and I appreciate those of you stuck with me. At this time, for those of you that want to stay on, I appreciate if you want to have questions or if any of you want to make comments. So feel free, this is your, this is your time. I know we're over, so say what you wanna say or whatever. Leslie, I just want to say thank you so very much. This was such a rich presentation. I want everyone to be privy to seeing this information when we create slides. We don't think about the intricate details. I've studied data visualization, so the color theory and things like that are, are known to me. The pre-attentive attributes, the size, the italics, the types of fonts, but people don't think about that when creating slides. So I love that you dived into the psychology and the reasoning why it's simple is better. So thank you so very much. I appreciate you. I will post this video to our YouTube channel for as many people to take a viewing okay. of this and hopefully to incorporate this in how they 
plan to go forward. And before we get into some more questions, I would like to thank Young May for organizing this and coordinating with Leslie. This was certainly the right thing to, to do for club officer training. This should be training for all Toastmasters. <laughs> I, I would like to avail an opportunity for each of you, if you'd like to volunteer with us for the district contest or the district conference, we have lots of roles that accommodates all different skill levels in 10 years with Toastmasters. So feel free to reach out to me either at PQD at tmdistrict38.org or training hyphen coordinator at tmdistrict38.org. Would love to have you all on our team. With that, uh, Young May, I think Young May is still here. Rhonda, sure could I ask a quick question about sure. volunteering? Yes. My understanding, even though I've been in this for many years and done different roles, would, would you just clarify, and this could benefit everybody, if someone from my area is competing, I cannot serve as a judge. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But if nobody, okay. So if I'm an area director, I'm almost essentially off the list if we send somebody. At, at the area, at the division level, it's a little bit different. Um, so there's different right. opportunities for you all. And it's not just judging that we need, right? right? So there's ballot counters and other functionary roles, contestant interviewer. So sure. it's not just all based on the judging, which has the eligibility criteria. Well, thanks. I just wanted to clarify that because Thank when you, you bounce from division to district and all the rest of it. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. Leslie, thank you so very much. I have to run. I have a husband that I have to feed. Yeah, they need attention too. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, to all Juanita. of you. Excellent, for your, excellent. Everybody. Thank you to all of you who posted your wonderful, appreciative uh, comments in chat. Um, I, I love this stuff. I hope you picked it up and love, love trying to share and help people learn and get better. So, Leslie, I have a question. Sure, Ann. For the uh, presentation, for the title, sometimes when you open up a template mm -hmm. and PowerPoint, I like the idea of the 2832 font. Sometimes the heading of the template is like 54 mm -hmm. or higher. That's okay. Is that like a shouting out and not good to use? Because I tend to like the bigger font, but after hearing you, I'm thinking that's not such a good idea. Well, Again, these are guidelines. They aren't like hard and fast. Right. Like, don't have it. like you saw, in some cases, I had seven or eight words on a line. Uh, what you need to, what you want to always consider is what's the point of having the super large text? If I have, if I just want that to sit in front of my viewers and let them know that's what's coming, I think that's fine. It's when people use that font at that size and then they throw a picture in there as well and you're right okay. sometimes the templates don't include a picture but you know we have tendencies to say oh that just looks so bland and you have to restrain yourselves and and just think about it and then go back and try to put yourself in someone's shoes but no don't ever think that you can't use 48 i've done it you know because i only have one thing i want to say or i'm going to follow it with bullet points I didn't really, I used a little bit of bullet point on one slide where I popped up things to remember. Bullet points are great, but if what, what's most important is if you want to say thank you to your audience at the end, that type of thing, and that's all you just really want to get across, then sure, go ahead and boldface your, your text. Just what else is on that slide? What's the point of that slide? Thank you. Sure. Anybody that else? It was a great presentation. Just thank you so much. I learned thank some you. tricks I didn't even know. So thank oh, you. Oh, well, I have plenty more to share. We were just <laughs> scraping the surface. So animation and all that we didn't touch. Uh, I used animation when building this. And there are a lot of things you can learn about making it efficient and reducing the number of slides. And somebody called me out on that. You could have put all these on one slide. And if you don't know what that means, I know what that person meant and they were right. It was just one last area that I missed. And I thought, but I spent a lot of, I want you to know, and I'm not yes. doing this for sympathy or to get, you know, kudos to build an effective presentation takes quite a it's bit of time. Hours. Yeah. Takes and hours. From the time that I, for me, I can 
I can get them out a little faster because it's so much easier for me. I know where I want to go. I know where I want to go. But the, um, the amount of time you spend planning is well worth it. If be, the assembly should be the final part. Like in other words, if you know you're going to transition or build a slide, build a slide, I'll admit I'm a right brain thinker. So as I start, I start with a plan and I start going and I go, you know what? I think I should do this, you know, and that can happen. But again, if I do it, I try it. And if it's working, then I keep it. So it's your, but yes, a good presentation, but I don't want to scare people from using one. This was a lengthy presentation. So it took a lot of hours to assemble it, which is fine. I love doing this stuff, but you're not going to be, my slide total on this was 62 slides. All right. Although you didn't see all 62 most likely you're going to be creating a presentation that might be 10 slides. So don't let that scare you. Don't let yourself think about it. And if you're ready to learn animation, you can contact me um, and we can talk about how that can be done or whatever. Awesome, awesome. Last, Leslie, what's your last name? Arnold, A-R-N-O-L-D. I can give you my email. I can put it in the chat, okay? And I know that it's real simple. And yes, I still use AOL. It's too much of an issue for me to change it. <laughs> I do have a Gmail account, which I use for other purposes, but so far AOL is still working. Anybody else have a question? Yes, Katie. So I, I think I tend to overfill my slides, but part of it is the medical things when I'm doing a medical presentation. So do you recommend, so I know there's an area where you can write notes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes fast. Do you know if the notes print out or do you have any advice on, on if someone wants slides, but you're trying to get a lot of information, you know, yeah. Right, kind of okay, so, right. So notes, definitely you can share with your audience. There are a couple ways of doing it. Uh, one way I, I disapprove of highly, I'll start with that is, and it just would make me want to be sick and wrench and run away was when I'd go to a PowerPoint presentation and I would receive a handout with every slide and every bit of note. And I said to myself, then why do I have to sit here? You know, because if I'm going to read it and then they, and what, what was always added was, well, that's so you can add notes. Well, then just give people a copy of your notes. And unfortunately on PowerPoint, at least on the version I'm using, um, I'm about to upgrade to the newest one. You can't just print out the notes without getting little pics. What I did was I just went through the slides. I set up an Excel document and just numbered my slides, just put the numbers in, bold paste them on the left and just copy and pasted my notes into each section. So. And that way you can just send them a script that way. You could write out all your notes ahead of time. It depends on how you do things and just send them a script, but do not send them, the, just send them the PowerPoint. In this day and age, they, they want PowerPoint to look at. Okay, does that answer your question? Good. Anybody else? Well, I don't know about you, but at least we're not missing beautiful weather out there, so. <laughs> It's pretty bleak. So anyways, okay. So if we don't have any more questions, I'm fine with closing out, Rhonda. So Okay, awesome, Leslie. Thank you so very much. And thanks to each of you, our club officers. This was a great session. Great use of my time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm have glad. a good weekend, everyone. All right, thank you for staying on. All right, bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.